thank you so much for joining us in this session. Um, and it's, it's unfortunate Peter is unable to sort of join in, but I'm going to sort of step in and see how well I'm able to fill in his shoes. Uh, well, the topic for today's presentation is dynamic glazing and we are sage glass. So I'm going to um, sort of show you how I've set up the presentation to be. Um, the agenda for today is we want to start off with the alignment that all of us have with sustainability, right? That's the one topic that ties all of us together. So I want to talk a little bit about Sage Glass, uh, what we want to do as a company about sustainability, what does the product do for sustainability, all of those things. Uh, the second topic we, I want to go through is just an introduction about the product itself and what Sage Glass does, what is Sage Glass, what is electrochromic glazing. A very quick introduction about that. Um, and a few examples, uh, you know, some form of a project showcase um, when, you know, they say the proof is always in the pudding. This is really what I wanted to show you actual results and projects um, that have seen the benefit of using products that are intelligent. And finally, modeling simulation support things that we do at Sage Glass to help uh, designers, engineers and architects make the right decision. I have put the, the numbers saying others, because in case you had any questions, and that's not covered in this presentation. We could definitely discuss this at the end of the presentation. So, um, to start off, um, who we are. Uh, we are a Sangobank company. Sangobank is a French um, originated company, 355 plus years old. The picture on the right is actually a picture of the Palace of Versailles, uh, right outside of Paris. Um, the company was founded to make mirrors for this Palace of Mirrors. Um, so Sage Glass is a company owned by Sangoban, by the Sangoban Group, uh, but this uh, Sage Glass is based at Faribo in Minnesota. Um, has been makes this is the only manufacturing facility of Sage Glass, and has been supplying um, high performance, high end glazing to over 28 countries around the world, over 1,000 um, in, installations. Um, we're definitely sort of leading the game in smart glass. Before I talk about sustainability, which I said I would sort of address first, I want to set out to a, a broad understanding of what the Sangoban Group offers um, so that you understand the perspective that we're coming from when we talk about our sustainability commitments. Sangoban as a group is largely focused on building materials. Um, they're one of the largest building materials manufacturers around the world. Uh, some of the names that you might be very familiar with is certainty when you know think about roofing insulation, Hunter Douglas ceilings. Um, these are all Sangoban products. Uh, Sangoban also has a wide variety of glazing products. We are first the world number two manufacturer uh, when it comes to glass. So we do everything from interior glass, exterior glass, high performance glass, and safety glass. When I say safety, it's um, fire resistant, blast proof, bullet resistant, all of those things. Um, so now that you know the context of the kind of industry we are we operate in, um, this is our sustainability roadmap that we wanted to talk about. So Sangoban has this overarching vision that we want to make the world a better home and we want to do it in two ways. One, for our customers with the products that we op, uh, you know, operate and offer to our markets. Um, and we do it in uh, even just to the customers, there are two parts to it. Um, a lot of our focus is on building materials. So our hope is that with the products that we create and we are able to sell into the market, we're able to decarbonize the built environment, right? Like you have lesser carbon in the insulation system. You have lesser carbon in your facade systems, et cetera. And we also manufacture products for the industry. Um, we make refractories, things that line, uh, you know, high temperature furnaces. We make electrolytes for batteries. We want to make sure that we decarbonize the industry through every piece of thing that we manufacture. And that's the first part of it, you know, what we do for our customers. And the second part, of course, is our own processes, right? When we say we're a manufacturer of glass, and if a lot of you might be familiar with how glass is manufactured. It's a high energy, fuel intensive process that it requires um, tons of gas or tons of natural um, fuels to run the furnaces, right? 
Um, and same as with manufacturing gypsum or insulation or any of these materials. <laughs> with that said, um, as a company, we've committed to moving towards a net zero carbon vision by 2050, um, doing it through multiple ways. The past year um, and this year going forward, internally, we have very high internal carbon prices when we talk about new investment or R&D to disincentivize our own internal um, use of carbon, right? Like we want to make sure that we are consciously limiting carbon consumption, carbon use, carbon emissions, all of that. And that's the goal as we go forward through 2050. So now that we've set the stage for um, how we're sort of aligned, how all of our messages are tied in into sustainability, I want to start off with where does Sage last fit into this picture? Well, um, I do come, I'm actually a trained architect. I do come from a background where facade design was a key part of the work that I used to do. And the most important facade design conundrum that everyone faces is how do you do this trade off between maximizing wellness, lowering the energy consumption, and keeping costs down, right? When I say wellness, it's about allowing a lot of natural daylight to come in, controlling glare, having a thermally comfortable space and having good views. And so when we as designers start off with putting glass around the building, we're like, okay, we're gonna get the outside in, we're gonna get a lot of views and natural daylight. The problem is it's always not positive. You, you end up getting some problems along with it. You know, You end up getting excessive glare, you end up getting excessive heat. And then you have to deal with pumping in more uh, HVAC systems to keep the building cooler. And then if you wanna control all of that, and then you're like toggling between, okay, how do I control my costs? And that we think is the problem to solve. And that we think is the op space in which Sage Glass operates. So this is really the slide that I like to show people when I start, uh, start introducing people to the product. The image on the left is something that all of us are familiar with. It's the traditional way of building facades. We start off with the building, put glass because we have a beautiful garden outside. We wanna see the views. And unfortunately, the moment glare or the sun's right outside of the window, we have to pull down the blinds. And blinds are pulled down at different levels. And there are few people who are comfortable, few people who are not. And if you saw this building from the outside, uh, it's what Peter keeps joking and calling the broken tooth facade, because if you've seen these large buildings and you see all of these blinds up and down, it really looks like, you know, like a broken tooth uh, profile. And the image on the right is an image of sage glass on the sage facade, right? Uh, sage glass is almost like sunglasses for your building, right? It tints and it's such a, a pleasing experience for every person in the building, you're still connected to the outdoors. You know, if you had blinds and pulled down the blinds entirely, you're, you don't have any more connectivity to the outdoors. You're letting in all of the heat. In effect, you started off with glass, but you ended up building an inefficient wall, right? It doesn't serve any purpose and that's where Sage Glass wants to fix the problem. So how does Sage Glass present itself? So Sage Glass uh, operates in four different tint levels. So the same piece of glass can be clear. Uh, when I say clear, it's about 60% light transmission. Uh, that's the term that we use in glazing. Uh, moving progressively to darker tint states, where in the full tint state, it's actually a 1% light transmission. And the 1% um, is, is not a random number. So research has proven that for us to be able to address glare effectively, the light transmission should be under 2% which is why the darkest in state of stage glass is 1%, at which state we think we can completely um, eliminate glare. And the thing with these different tint states is that not only does it control glare or excessive light, it also helps to moderate the solar heat gain coefficient in the building. And what this means is, and that's the, those are the numbers that you see on the second row of the table, um, the 0.41, uh, 0 0.15, 0 0.10, and 0 0.09. Those numbers, is ju it's just a percentage of how much direct heat are you permitting inside the building, right? So in the clear state, and, and this is always a function of how much light you're letting. It, it's always linked very closely. 
So the darker you're able to tint the glass, you're able to let in lesser amount of heat. Um, so what what's very unique about this glass is you do have high energy facades which are not dynamic, which would operate in any one of these phases, right? It could be at a 60% light transmission or it could be at an 18% light transmission, but it would be in that state all year round. There's, there's no dynamism in this. Sage glass can toggle between all of these states and be all of this at the same time. So what is, you know, what is sage glass? So I see sage glass as three components. The first one being an IGU or an IGU is an insulated glass unit. Um, simply put, typical insulated glass unit is just two pieces of glass held together by a spacer and you either fill in air or argon or any gas to make sure that it's a nice insulated piece of glass. With sage glass, and I don't want to go into a lot of the details here, but the, the interesting part or what I call, what I think is the cool part of sage glass is that out of the box, sage glass comes to you as a laminated insulated glass unit. So it's not just two pieces of glass held together by a spacer, but the outer pane of glass in itself is actually two pieces of glass held by a, a insulate by an interlayer. And this interlayer, you know, just holds these two pieces of glass together and then you have a spacer and then you have a third piece of glass. That's that's the product that you would get out of the box. Why is this important? Uh, you ask, well, the having a laminated outer layer is different and very useful because it's a very safe product. Um, let me say if you if you had any impact on the glass, you know, if you, if there was a, a stone thrown on the piece of, on the glass and the glass broke, and if you had pieces of glass falling off the building, and if this was at a height, you're prone to injure anybody who's walking below. If it was a laminated piece of glass, you will not have shards of glass falling from the height. You will have them sticking to the interlayer. So that's the advantage. Uh, having a laminated piece of glass is inherently safer. Having a laminated piece of glass is also an opportunity to customize the glass, right? Because there are two panes of glass and the inner pane is, of course, not customizable because that's where the technology is. But the outer pane of glass, you can fit it. You can sort of see if you want do I want a reflective looking facade? Do I want a not so reflective looking facade? As designers, um, having this laminated glass gives you the flexibility to use sage glass in the way that you would want to. So that's one part of sage glass. The second part of sage glass is because this glass, is, you know, tends with electricity, it does have a lot of wires, right? So um, the glass itself comes with a tiny pigtail peeking out of the glass. And the pigtail needs to be connected to a bunch of wires that needs to be routed through the mullions, uh, which we call a frame cable through all of the framing. And then all of these wires go into a control panel that can be in your electrical closet. And then you could have sensors depending on how you would want to use the, the whole system. So uh, when stage glass is installed on a building, both the glass and these wiring systems and sensors, control panels, all of that is provided and it's installed on the facade. And then we have the third component, which is the system intelligence that runs the system. Now, the, the, the most important part of a dynamic glazing facade is that you need to have a system that can help you pick the right state for your building in the most intelligent manner, right? So the way we do it is uh, multiple parts. We start off with prioritizing what the building's goal is. You know, sometimes the goal is all is to always manage glare, always bring in daylight um, after that, and finally energy optimization. Right? Uh, sometimes it could be the other way around. Say in summers, the building would be like we only want to manage energy first and glare second and daylight third. I mean, depending on building priorities, we could take in all of these inputs. We also take in the inputs um, by counting for the building location, orientation, the sun path, uh, the interior layout of the building, and our sensors, which can be placed on the roof of the building, look at local weather changes. For example, you might just have a sudden cloud cover. We, our system can be linked to the building management system. So if your HVA system um, detects, you know, that it's getting really, really hot, and maybe it's because of uh, the glass 
I mean, maybe it might help if the glass tinted, um, you know, these two systems can talk. If your lighting systems detect that um, maybe there is an opportunity for more natural light and the glass can clear out and not be so dark. So, you know, we uh, just having this system and that system intelligence helps these conversations happen internally and all of these inputs are dynamically processed using algorithms that we um, put into the um, system. And then you have a result where the glass is responding to the needs of the building. And the way we do it is um, we have like a portfolio of products um, in the way it tints, right? So the image that I showed you about how the glass tints in four different states, well, that is um, what you see in the first um, image here on the left, which is, I'm gonna use my pointer. So yeah, the first image on the left is what we internally call our classic product, because it, it is uh, really the, the most common dynamic glazing product you would get from any manufacturer for that fact. Mm -hmm. uh, it is a product where the entire pane of glass takes a particular tint state, right? It can go from a 60% to a 1% or anything in between. We then heard from a lot of customers that, hey, we operate blinds differently. We sometimes get blinds halfway down one third of a way down. And then we, can you do that with the glass? Can you mimic the same things? Because we don't want the glass to go entirely dark because sometimes we feel glare just on the top part of the facade. So that's why we um, were able to uh, develop the light zone product, uh, which is the image that you see here. It's from the pictures of a restaurant in um, Switzerland overlooking the lake and they really had a lot of um, glare issues both from reflecting off of the lake and directly from the sun as well so they had this need for being able to let a natural light and still address glare um, and we and the the thing that's unique about this is you do realize it's not three pieces of glass but it's just one piece of glass but we're able to control every piece of every part of the same piece of glass differently and um this was really a product that was um, extremely liked by customers. And then as customers started working with us, they had another request. They said, hey, we like this, but can you make it a little more sort of gradient-ish, uh, not like blocks of colors? Then it would be nicer. And that's why um, we have Sage Plus Harmony. It is really our newest, latest and greatest product. Um, and if you look at this uh, facade, it's actually tinted in a gradient form. You know, the top is darker, the bottom is clear, uh, and you would barely see any difference. So it's addressing the glare at the right parts, letting in the natural light at the rest of the parts. The space inside the building is very balanced and um, beautiful to be in. A few more pictures about uh, how Harmony operates. Like I was telling you, uh, the tin states that you see at the bottom, 1, 6, 18, 60, these are the different states in which any dynamic glazing manufacturer would have their glass move. You know, some of these numbers might slightly vary, but essentially that's the only um, zone in which they would operate. Stage Glass Harmony can do that and can do all of the tin states on the top as well, where it can go from dark to clear, clear to dark, light to clear, clear to light and all of that. And this is actually a picture that I took just about a week or so ago from a, because I was in the office and it, it was just amazingly beautiful because you can see that, you know, the, the computer, the television screen at the end of the corridor is so much brighter. You, you know, it's the typical response when you want to have a PowerPoint presentation. The first thing you do is pull down the blind so you can see the TV screen a little more clearer, right? And the glass actually does this for you and it's still letting in a lot of natural light. And it doesn't make the clouds, I mean, the outside look as dreary as it was, but looks so much more nicer and, and, and enhanced, you know? So that's um, really about the product itself. And this is just a quick video that I have just to show you how the tint states, um, gosh, how, I'm gonna see if the video doesn't play work. I mean, it's just a video that it was supposed to show how the glass tinting, but if this doesn't play, it's good. Okay. So this is um, really a summary of what Sage Glass, the product is before I go on into how do we help with the rating systems and all of that. The product is a singular product 
which can achieve um, about six goals, which I think are six design goals that all of us as designers might have. The first one is to have energy efficient glazing. Um, the second one is to have smart building integration because that's that's um, an important topic these days. Third one being occupant comfort. You know, you're not just addressing energy, you're addressing glare, you're addressing natural light, all of these components. Then you could eliminate shading systems, you know, clunky blinds, external shading systems that require excessive cleaning, expensive maintenance, all of that. Um, we could eliminate, uh, we could uh, improve sustainability initiatives with using a product that's, you know, helping us from an energy angle. The product itself is sustainably manufactured, all of that. And finally, uh, you have the ability to design with more glass because initially having excessive glass was uh, an inhibitor because it has problems that come with it. But if this product solves some of those problems, you can technically build with more glass. So uh, this is just a quick snapshot of all our projects, um, a lot of our projects across industry, right? Like commercial real estate, retail, hospitality, higher ed, airports. And honestly, a lot of these pictures are also global. So we have installations, I think, in the Haneda Airport in Japan, in, um, the, desert, in the desert of Dubai, we have a bunch of installations. We have installations up here in Minnesota, cold, cold Minnesota. So really like climatic conditions across the globe, the product works, the product performs. So yeah. And this is where, um, now that we sort of have a quick introduction about the product itself, I wanted to show you some examples of about how Sage Glass can help achieve or how it has achieved, uh, help buildings achieve sustainability um, standards. Uh, the first thing is, um, and a lot of customers ask us is, does the product help us comply with a lot of um, rating systems that we might want to target? And we do, we've actually worked um, across the globe. Uh, we have a lot of rating systems that customers are targeting in each of the geographies that we're presented. And um, we have seen that they have been able to leverage the use of stage class um, to help gain points in their, um, in their goals. Just for an example, I've just put in two uh, rating systems here. Uh, lead, lead V4, for example, we could potentially, the use of electrochromic glazing by Sage Glass can actually offer anywhere between 22 to 27 points in a bunch of categories that I've listed here. Uh, with well, uh, again, we can support on multiple categories like air, light, comfort, and mind. And, um, yeah, so so really any rating system, uh, we could work with your consultant and make sure that we're presenting all of the documentation required to be able to design for, to reach these goals. Um, this is actually um, a, a pet picture. You, you know, it's, it's a very favorite picture of mine to use. Um, this is the North American headquarters of Sage Club, of Sangoba. And this picture was, uh, this, this building has been used as a part of a living laboratory study by USGBC. Um, they used over 60 Sangoban products on this uh, in this building. You know, the, the glass that you see outside is sage glass. Um, they've used all, all kinds of acoustic materials on the inside. Um, it's, it's an amazing project. This building is certified double lead platinum. In the good old days, we used to host a lot of tours uh, for people in the area um, or designers uh, if they wanted to see and experience how the product made a difference. And it's interesting because when you walked from one room to the other, especially if it was a working day and we had a lot of customer service people uh, who are always on their phone, um, you would really see that it, it doesn't disturb you because there's so much care taken to how different regions or different parts of the building was treated with different building materials and not just stage class, really everything. It, it was truly an experience. I mean, when we're over the COVID space of life, uh, hopefully we can get back to touring this place. It was, it was a nice place to be. Well, from there, I want to move over to three examples that I've just um, sort of cherry picked for this presentation. Um, and just also in the interest of time, um, I've also chosen these three examples for our three different building types. Um, to show you how um, some of our customers have, again, leveraged stage glass to uh, attain some of their goals that they had. 
Uh, this is a picture of the American Geophysical Union headquarters in the DC area, and they were renovating their project for net zero. Um, and their goal, and the, the building tech initially had very little glazing area to begin with. However, um, with the use of about 11,000 square foot of triple pane stage glass, um, they were able to um, reduce 29% of the overall heat gain through windows versus um, if they did have a regular window with manual sheets, because manual sheets does nothing to, apart from just cutting out the light, it doesn't do anything to the heat. Um, even the peak window heat gain was decreased, uh, which in effect sort of translates to an opportunity to optimize the HVAC install, installed capacity, right? It could go through an energy modeling exercise. We assess that it could potentially go down from 23 tons to about 15 tons. Uh, electric lighting also reduced by about 5% because with sage class, you're bringing in so much natural light. So you don't necessarily have to have artificial lights on for most parts of the year. So the building again, um, they were, they started occupancy, I think in mid 2019 and then COVID happened. Um, I guess they're beginning to open up for tours again very soon. Um, it, it's a great site to visit if you're anytime around the DC area. The second project that I wanted to talk about is again a retail space. Um, it's the Shields All Sports Store. Um, I mean, this this is really like a carnival, right? Like it is a sports goods store. They have a Ferris wheel right in the middle of the store. They have these huge rock um, rock uh, setup, art setup. And uh, their goal is they want customers to be hanging around the area, looking at things. Um, and they wanted to bring the outside in and the biggest part of the outside that they could not bring in was the sun. And with Sage Glass, uh, they now have about five stores with us and designing more stores. Uh, all of these, these five stores have this entire skylight area and the clear story windows with Sage Glass. So they're able to bring in so much natural light and still moderate it in, in a way that it's comfortable to occupants and their occupants are both staff and customers who are around the space. And then people are enjoying all of their exhibits, looking at things and going through the entire experience uh, with that much more, uh, you know, that much less of a stress of the, the glare in their eye. So they did actually an exercise about comparing two of their stores, one store with electrochromic glazing, which is the Johnstown store. And the other one was the existing store in Overland Park, which does not have the EC. Well, EC was not the, they, they did a bunch of improvements and EC was one of it, but they did see significant impact in actual energy savings, right? Like this was their energy consumption in kilowatt hours, their, their actual electricity bills. And um, they felt that this was a huge difference and they've since then chosen to go with Sage Glass in every new store that they opened up uh, or that they brought into their construction um, track after this uh, particular phase. And the third project that I have is uh, a university campus because I thought, um, you know, for the group who's interested in the academia and the university space, I think this is again a great example. The Bowie State University, um, they again started, uh, they had this whole round uh, space where just having the use of dynamic glazing and their assessment of the use of dynamic glazing they had the feeling that they could actually change the HVAC system, you know, from a forced air cooling system to a chill beam system, and therefore even like shave off a lot of the building height because otherwise they would have a lot of, they would need space for duct work and drop ceilings and all of that. So um, it was there, they felt that having the dynamic glazing system and being able to reduce the amount of incoming heat is definitely going to help them significantly. And um, they've claimed that it helped them move from potentially a lead gold to a lead platinum. So those were my three examples. And just to kind of round off with my last few slides on the, on the product and the company itself, we're a product that, um, well, electrochromic glazing is, has been around for 30 years now um, and maybe more commercially available in the past uh, 15 to 20, it is a product that's well tested, standards exist, um, and it's been tested for 
as you know, we do accelerated testing for 30 to 50 years. So the product um, is it has a has a very clear mechanism in the way of evaluation. So um, and we have certification bodies that acknowledge the use of the product. And finally, uh, with Sage Glass, as, as me, and this is really my my day job at Sage Glass, um, I help customers choose Sage Glass for their building, or even decide which parts of my building really need Sage Glass, or does my building need Sage Glass to begin with? And the way uh, I do it with my team is that we work very closely with architects, use their um, building design and run simulations and analysis and see where could we potentially see glare risk? Are we seeing, um, does the building design have daylight problems? Uh, are we gonna have serious thermal comfort issues? And can we use Sage Glass in a way to address all of these problems? So that's something that we uh, typically offer a lot of our customers. Um, and we've, we've seen that customers see value in seeing that exercise done on their buildings because uh, well, modeling, energy modeling, energy simulation is a straightforward process. It, dynamic glazing requires a little bit of nuance because, you know, there's there's an algorithm that figures when the glass does what, right? So that's the part that we come in. Eventually, we're actually able to tell customers, and these are just numbers, but we're able to tell customers what's the, you know, return on investment that they have. If they're investing on a Sage Glass product, how soon does the premium that the product has pay off uh, with all of the other gains that you might be having. Because once you have Sage Glass, you're not spending on expensive shades. You're not spending on replacing that shades in the next few years. You have an HVAC system that's not working as hard as it would have been in if it were a regular piece of glass. So we're able to do these numbers, um, collaborating with our customers based on their building area, based on the energy loads on their space, um, all of this is a part of the service that we offer to our customers in order to make the right choice. We also do remote monitoring uh, of some of the projects, and that's if the customer wants it uh, to be monitored, right? Like this is, uh, of course, we get an agreement that the customer wants the building to be monitored, and we believe it sort of it's it's really a peace of mind uh, thing, right? So you don't have to worry about having a potential failure coming up and then figuring out what to do with the pane of glass. But we can actually see some if you know a wire is potentially getting clipped and then we're not seeing the right amount of charge reaching the IGU, we can keep you informed saying, hey, there's a, a cable that might, you might want to change out because uh, it looks like it might have gotten clipped uh, somewhere on the way. So we can check for all of this. We can even check if somebody has been fiddling with the controls and then not letting the glass, you know, work like how it's supposed to be. Um, that can be monitored as well. And a lot of building owners and operators find a lot of value in this whole remote monitoring process. And finally, we operate like a living lab. Uh, we keep looking at what we can do with the glass, um, because glass, of course, is this whole skin of the building and it can do a bunch of things. It, it's occupying so much space. So we are constantly exploring if we can put in a toilet screen, like a touch a TV screen that can become a display. Um, so you can actually use that to entertain. You can use that to use your presentations. You can use it in airports for wayfinding any of this, right? So. We are constantly exploring what the glass can do. And in closing, we always end up with this question as to when is smart glass a good fit, right? So in my view, it's a combination of both the functional needs and the project profile. When you are looking at a building that you want to showcase as new and high tech and focusing on wellness and sustainability, and if you want this building to be an ambassador in the area, we think smart glass has space on your buildings, right? So, so that's really that's really all from me. Um, this is Sage Glass, our facility here in Minnesota, and thank you so much. Thank you, Sumya. That was that was wonderful. I I actually have a question, and I I'm wondering is this technology available for uh, residential construction, or is it just commercial? 
At this point, we uh, mostly uh, focus on commercial construction. Um, that said, we have actually done huge, um, large residential projects in, in the Middle East, for example, huge villas, but these are the kind of villas where we install over around 10,000 square foot of glass within one villa, right? So these are humongous villas. So um, it, it's just that, you know, when you optimize for the cost of the controls plus the glass, sometimes the economics of scale helps you uh, get a better return if it was a larger scale installation. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Um. I have a question, uh, Sumya. Thank you. That was really, really cool. I just love how those windows work. Could you explain how the algorithms work? So there's a computer system in the background that's measuring the light coming in. Yes. Well, it's it's a bunch of things. So to start off, uh, we feed in a bit of baseline data. That's you know the sun path. So we know that in the summer months, the sun's going to, at 8 a.m., you're probably going to start seeing the sun on the east facade. So the east glass is supposed to begin to tint at a certain level. And then after 12 noon, you don't see it anymore on the east facade, you're going to start seeing it on the west facade. So a lot of the baseline information is already fed into the system. And then the algorithm decides whether it wants to use the baseline information or if it's seeing any local requirements that it needs to optimize for. And when I say local requirements, it could be, there could be a switch right next to the glass and I could be near the glass and saying, hey, I want this to go darker because I'm sitting next to this place and I'm uncomfortable. And if I hit the button, the glass is gonna say, okay, external information, priority one, I'm gonna to move to what this person's asking me to do. So I, the, the algorithm always prioritizes external information over the baseline and then shifts back to the baseline because that's the best case scenario, right? That, that's how you would want to optimize the glass to work at. So after about two to three hours, it's going to slowly go back to what it was supposed to do originally, unless somebody goes back and fiddles with it. So the algorithm is constantly learning and picking different signals and optimizing for the best uh, results. That's amazing, thank you. I have one other question, yep. Sonia, and, and that is, um, ha, has there been any comparison to just plain walls versus the sage glass? Is is there a big difference between, I, I guess I'm just wondering, because in Texas, um, we have so many buildings that are all glass and... Um, well, um, there are, um, let's say, Two parts to this. Having a lot of glass is definitely not going to be um, if if heat uh, managing heat into the space is the goal. Having a wall is definitely going to be more effective than having glass on the building, right? It's a given because a solid wall is so much more a better insulator than glass. It is, but the fact is that sometimes we don't always want a wall because. If it was a smaller room, having a small window is fine. But these days we build office spaces with large floor plates. Therefore, if you want to have the natural light come in at least about 15 feet into the building space, you want to have a lot of you know, openings on the entire facade so that the person who's seated right in the middle of that floor plate gets a bit of this you know, natural light. Otherwise, it's just going to feel like he's going to be, he or she is going to be working in the dark all the time. So it's always a case of what do we want to optimize for, right? So if you want to optimize for natural light, which I think we should be because in a work environment, if you are going to be in a closed room, you're not going to be effective and research has proven that you want to have connectivity to the outdoors. So then you have to have glass. But then once you have glass, you need to have an, a glass that's energy efficient and not just glass, but the entire facade system needs to be energy efficient and optimize for the rest of it. But if you looked at it just from an academic point of view, a piece of wall is probably a better insulator. Thank you. I, I, I agree with you. Absolutely. The studies have shown that when people can connect to outdoors and nature, they're much more productive. And, um, 
and, and I guess I just figured that you could save money with the indoor lighting as well, which yeah. would probably balance things out. So yeah, thank you. Yeah. Uh, looks like we have a question in the Q and A, uh, but I cannot, I cannot see it. I can Lori got it. or Andy, can you see it? So it yes. says going um, forward, will Dallas College start building energy efficient, sustainable buildings, or keep the building, um, the, the energy hogs that we're having right now, essentially. Well, that's an excellent question. Thank you. Um, and and so the the first part of that answer is we actually have hired an energy manager. His name is Garrett Rosser, and um, he is doing an outstanding job of taking our existing buildings and making them as energy efficient as possible. So that's that's the good news. In going forward, in the future, all of our renovations will be uh, will will be creating high performance building and absolutely yes um, when we start building new buildings um, they will be high performance building with a very very low eui energy utilization index so i my my personal goal for the college and, and it hasn't been approved by the board yet but my personal goal is that someday uh, in the not too distant future we can achieve net zero energy for the whole college. I mean, yeah, net zero is, is an amazing goal to have, especially it's such a huge institution, with so many people, equipment, oh gosh, yeah. But we can do it. Of, of course, we, <laughs> we can, we should, like we need to do it with a sense of urgency, yeah. I have a question. Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. So, how resilient is this glass against here in Texas? We experienced a lot of tornadoes. So, you know, how sustainable is it for this type of inclement weather? Um, well, if you're looking at it from an angle of safety, uh, we have actually supplied glass in some of the hurricane prone areas. Um, it's just about designing the glass to do. Um, to be resistant to hurricane like you assume the right kind of wind load and be able to use the right thicknesses of glass panes outside uh, so because fundamentally this is a laminated igu uh, it does yield well to do all of these customizations and it yields well for having a much safer solution because the lamination makes sure that even if there was a small piece of thing that hit the facade you wouldn't have pieces flying around and you wouldn't have shards falling off because all of that is going to be stuck to the interlayer and then you can replace it safely. So yes, um, hurricane prone areas, um, the same rules of designing facades apply. Um, it's just about accounting for the right amount of wind loads. Okay, thank you. Larry, Andy, do we have any more questions in the Q&A? We do not. Okay. Well, Sonia and, and Peter, we appreciate so much you joining us today.